the third is how the book, then the nine tailors, so we are talking about Dorothy Sayers. Okay, Lord Peter Wimsey starts off as a paper thin caricature, a silly ass. He ends up as a silly ass and paper thin. Okay. <laughs> but does he stay that way all the way through? Yeah. He doesn't, does he? He remain, he's a human being. By the time Harriet Vane uh, accepts his proposal of marriage, he is now a human being, right? In that book. Now, I'm supposed to be devil's advocate, aren't I? Should be arguing. <laughs> okay, he's a silly ass. But, but, she, but she fills in some of his wartime experiences to, to, to block it. She was, I think, the first one who moved away from just the, the caricature of the, the private detective or the, the, the gentleman detective. And she able to pad that out a little bit with, with his wartime experiences and his, his reaction to his memories of the war. And, and she was able to build on that towards him. But he is still very much a, a thin character, but, he, but he, he's a move forward from Barrow. He doesn't Do we, have nearly as many irritating ticks as Barrow. Uh, Do we have time for blue-blooded detectives these days? Clearly Dorothy Sayers liked the fact that he was blue-blooded. Do we need that today? Do we like that today? What does it mean? Aristocratic. Aristocratic. Mm. Hey, hey, I'll go on. Yes, what about Elizabeth George? Okay, yes, Elizabeth George. <laughs> so that shows, that, the, that shows that the tradition is still alive of the aristocratic copper and his you know, people around him are lower down the social scale, a set vision of England which doesn't really exist anymore. And I think these days being an aristocratic copper will be more of a disadvantage than an advantage. Absolutely. Mm. But I think it's nice that there's room for everything. I think it shows that how fiction. I personally feel is, 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 a, is a more interesting genre today than it was in the day of the Christian or, yes, or yes. Um, Colin Doyle because people have stopped writing just the plain who done it and now they do the who done it with the characters, with the depth of research, with the you know the full body um, crime story behind it and all the psychology that that involves and people give far more grand for your buck nowadays than, than those writers They're, they're not no here. longer moving checkers across the yeah. Yeah. And, uh, dealing with people. For real people, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you get a, a much better experience from a, from a modern class. <laughs> so we're making him the charm of the long goodbye. This is traditionally regarded as his best book. His best book is undoubtedly the big sleep, I will say here and now. What's wrong with the long goodbye is he started to grow impatient with the form. And he's having these conversations with Ian Fleming where they're both sick of their characters. And they're saying, oh, hell do I kill off Bond? How the hell do I kill off Marlow? And Chandler says, well, Marlow wouldn't live anyway. A man who'd been so irritated to so many gangsters would be a, a dead man. <laughs> but the long goodbye is, is an inflated, bloated... Oh, well, you don't have to answer this one. Well, this is, I don't have to put her on the spot for these ones. <laughs> is it a bloated novel? I don't know it very well, to be honest. Uh, but I would go, uh, agree with you about The Big Sleep. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a faulty novel, but it, it's, it's, it's his best and it's a fascinating one to read. So why is it that the first book, the best, the best Bond book is Casino Royale? Anybody agree with that? Yeah. On the Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah. I think because, because quite often, it's particularly I think if people get their an early book that they've written published, they've made the mistake of putting all their best ideas yeah. into it. Yeah. Because if they get their early books rejected, they then mine that for good ideas for many books to come. <laughs> okay, then we come to a book in which a group of people are from disparate backgrounds all agree to appear on a train that commit the same murder. <laughs> Anybody buy that plot? Anybody, if somebody says to you, you really dislike that guy, we'll get tickets on this train and we'll all kill him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have, now, okay, that's a classic case where the, the plotting carries it, doesn't it? Sure. Yeah. Does it matter that it's so absurd? But we yes. are talking about murder on the express. So I'm trying yeah. to yeah. <laughs> you work that out. You got that one, Jane. <laughs> it's very absurdity. It's almost the whole point of the book. Yeah. Do you think? It's kind of silly. I mean, in my mind, it's kind of silly. I mean, nowadays, if you wrote a book like this, it would be awful. And I just think, you know, times have changed. Better. Going back to, to Christie adaptations, why is it that every adaptation of Marple? has the actress playing Marvel playing her straight, be it Judy McKenzie or whoever, and everyone around her like they're in an end of the pier show at, at the Skegness. <laughs> <laughs> they're all encouraged to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the only real human being in any Marvel adaptation is, is, is uh, 
why does the, does the books lend themselves to that? Or is that just what TV producers think that's what we want from Agatha Christie? It, I mean, it's, it's an incredible sort of fairy tale world that, 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 that she's involved with. And I can't see why the, the, the TV people keep, keep turning them out. Because who's interested in a little old lady who knits and says, oh, yes, I know what's happening there? It just doesn't. Well, hasn't it? It's the vision. Have we got the Americans in the room? No Americans. <laughs> Isn't that the vision that foreigners want to Britain? In which everybody knows everybody else's business. Well, once upon a time, maybe, when, when the Marcus Rutherford films were being made. Not now, surely. Not now. That's quite interesting. The Marcus Rutherford, the first Marvel on film. Ah. Uh, okay, am I wrong? <laughs> no, no, no. no. I'm, I'm, you're going to say it's Grace Fields. Grace Fields. Didn't Grace. do. Yeah, she's Marvel in 1956. Younger people in the audience won't know who Gracie Fields is. We move on. But, but that's an interesting thought, because that, that marble is played for laughs. Agatha Christie marble has nothing to do with, with, uh, with the fantastic Barbara Rutherford, who is our, one of our great comic actresses. Yes. But it's nothing to do with marble, is it? Absolutely not. So what about the various films of uh, the better known actress? Albert Finney. He starts that tradition that, that David Suchet carries on of making a caricature. Is there any other way to play Poirot other than as a caricature? It would be very interesting to see it attempted, not as a caricature. And what would you have left? Yeah. I think it's interesting about the Barrow films that the uh, the later ones, where Miss Lemon and uh, Hastings have disappeared, that the writers, and I think to some extent Suchet, have tried to give more depth to the character. And, and it, the, the murder on the Orange and Express TV version um, was very strange because Poirot was doing all sorts of emoting, which is not in the film, and it becomes very angry, if you remember, at the end of the film. Um, and it just was strange to see him becoming uh, an emotional, angry character. And I think they were thinking, we must make a bit more of this, this man. Maybe the, maybe the strength of these, these sort of Agatha Christie in particular, these, as you said, paper thin character, is that they lend themselves to constant reinterpretation. Yeah. Yes. Everybody thinks they can bring something new to the table. I, mean, I remember doing some research once on models in the lab, and the, you saw some amazingly beautiful women. It was just incredible. Um, but the girls who were making good, proper money on a regular basis were completely blank-faced. They had really very full real beauty. They were just a, a, a bare canvas, which could be reinterpreted by photographers and companies in whichever way they wanted to make them up. Maybe it's a sim similar syndrome for Agatha yeah. Christie's characters. So is, if, if those detects a kind of tabula rasa, somebody like Benedict Cumberbatch can come in and just yeah. do his thing? Yeah, I think it's interesting because they, they probably have the kind of longevity that possibly better written characters from more modern novels will not have mm. because you can only play them the way the writer has taken the time and trouble to write them. Now, I've written a book on the following novelist, 